G'day guys, welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. My name is Isaac, aka Shrek, the host of the Noob Spirit Podcast. This is the show where generally I head off to different corners of the world to interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters and uh, share their tips, stories, advice and wisdom to help you become a better spirit. Today's pretty different. We uh, This is sort of like... Uh, it's a trip debrief, really, for a charter trip, a five-day charter, uh, a five-day spearfishing charter to the Southern Great Barrier Reef. There's more than uh, 14 interviews in this single episode, and basically, it just it can give you a real good insight into what a five-day reef hunting um, charter can be like. And uh, there's fantastic bits of advice and stuff in there for for, for all levels of spiro. So I hope you enjoy it. As I sort of uh, re-listened to it, I couldn't help but smile at some of the memories and that because it, it happened about six, about four months ago now. So um, bloody a bloody good experience. I really enjoyed it. Big thanks to Robin Cornelian for editing today's interview. Um, we start off the chat chatting with Wayne Judge, and I'm super helpful as usual, uh, chatting with him because he managed to stab himself and got airlifted off by the RACQ life flight. So let's go straight there. Let's get into chatting with Wayne Judge about his experience. Oh, yeah. Today's podcast brought to you by brand new sponsor, Neptonics. They might be brand new to the New Spirit podcast, but they have been around for years. Neptonic spearfishing produce and represent some of the best spearfishing gear on the planet. Jerry Guerrero says, if we sell it, well, hang on, hang on, let me do his voice. If we sell it, we believe in it, we trust it, and dive it. And uh, Jerry Guerrero, he's a, he's a knowledgeable dude, and I, I'll back that Neptonic statement. If they stock it, they believe in it, and you can use it. Neptonics.com, use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off store-wide. N-O-O-B-10-1-0. Neptonics.com, proud sponsors of the Noob Spiro podcast. G'day Noob Spiro community, um, we're here aboard the Eastern Voyager, heading in very early from this trip. I'm here with Mr. Wayne Judge, um, and you'll see from the photo exactly how he's positioned. Um, tell us how you're going, Wayne. Look, uh, I'm fairly sharp mentally, got a bit of a sore leg. Okay, so you've cut your leg, you're laying pronated, and we're headed back in emergency style. What happened? Look, I, uh, I think I grabbed the fish, and it's a big fish, it's a big mackerel, and it was a bit too green, and, uh, but I got it under control, grabbed my knife out, had that, but then the fish flicked, and I think uh, during the, uh, the, the flick of the fish, dislodged my hand off it and went down and uh, stuck the knife in my leg. It sounds rugged. Um, how does it look? It looks a bit rough, you know. Uh, you know, it gets a bit of blood coming out and things like that. But, you know, it's like when you've sort of looked at a, a few things like that, it's not enough to shake you, you know. So uh, just put the pressure on it, got out, got the pressure on it. Thanks to the back to the basic guys, they uh, looked after the fish and untangled my gun, got that on board, and we come back to on board. Just held the pressure on it, like uh, uh, all the way back to the boat, and then uh, when I got back here, we just got the, the first aid onto it, etc. So, um, there's a lot of bleeding straight away. Well, it looked like it, but once I was out of the water, we had the pressure on it, and it stopped it then. But when I looked down and, and I was having to get out of the water, and I was flexing my leg a bit, yeah, there was a bit of blood there in the water. You're not a big bloke either. You look quite um, pale on the boat, and I, I was feeling for you immediately. Did you get a good look inside where you've um, opened yourself up? Yeah, we uh, I, I, we did have a look at it, and uh, you know, what's actually happened is that at some stage I've severed uh, either an artery or can, um, where a muscle's connected to the artery, and the muscles bunched up, and this is why we're you know going to uh, good lengths to get me under uh, better medical care is because of the uh, the muscle is bunched up and it'll need to be uh, reconnected by the look of it you know I'm not an expert on things things but uh, that's what it looks like so but the important thing really in the whole situation is that you landed the fish yeah got the fish got weighed 21.5 you know that's uh, not a bad mackerel you know Gave me a hell of a right, a hell of a run, you know. It was a good shot, good holding shot, and then, but not a kill shot, and it towed me around for a while. And then you got it in your hands, and it slid up and and done the deed on you. Yeah. What a prick of a fish! Yeah, that's what I did. Exactly. 
Any any takeaways for uh, people listening to this accident? Could it have been um, prevented, or or could you have done anything different? I know it's a prick of a question this soon after. Look, I think uh, I probably grabbed my knife too soon, and I didn't have the fish completely under control when I had the knife in the hand. That actually is the crux of it, I think. But uh, I think it's covered uh, core on footage with Back to the Basic guys. They were diving with me, and uh, it's quite likely we'll see what's going to happen. You know what happened, you know. But that's what I think I did. I got the knife in my hand too soon, and the fish wasn't subdued enough. So just to sum up, I mean, we've got As here from Back to Basics now. So pretty much. It wouldn't have happened if, if you'd had a better crew. Is that what you were saying before? <laughs> yeah. I actually didn't think I said that. Did I say that? <laughs> uh, I think the cap, sorry, as here, guys, have just walked into the room, uh, onto the back deck, actually. Look, Wayne would most certainly be dead if it wasn't for the Back to Basics crew and his <laughs> optimism, given our uh, soothing, um, the soothing nature of our crew. Apparently, as soon as you got him back on the boat, Jack started trying to give him mouth to mouth. I was like, "Jeep, is that, I think it's his leg, boys." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was definitely his leg. And Strick said, "No, everyone, get out of the way. I need to get on those lips straight away. We need to get oxygen in there." Yeah. Um, everyone was slightly confused, but Strick seemed to think it was a good idea. But um, well, he is alive, though. and it's worked. Look, yeah. it's a miracle. He's alive. He looks fantastic. He does. Yeah. So, um, Wayne, we'll have to check back in on you in a in a couple of hours. But um, any any final comments with regards to the mouth to mouth? Uh, look, uh, I hate kissing people with beards. <laughs> actually, actually, there was kind of a bit of cuddling. People were looking after me, you know, and uh, bringing me shares and, you know, asking if I'm all right about every 10 seconds, you know. So it's kind of like quite comforting, you know. I'm glad you've been comforted and then I've come along with some sarcasm. Um, no, nah, well, we'll check back in on you, but how, how are you feeling right now? I'm all right. Sore leg, you know, but I'm all right, you know. Feeling pretty mentally sharp, so, you know, can't be too bad. How much blood did you reckon you lost? That's impossible to say. I actually, when I got back to the boat, I felt a little bit faint sitting up there and wasn't sure if it was, you know, my wetsuit was too tight or something. Uh, the hard part was, and this was the hard part, is going back, I realised that I was going to have to get my wetsuit off, I'm going to have people all around me, and it was that one day I forgot to put jocks on. <laughs> uh, that's excellent. That's excellent, Wayne, and um, and that's important too. But you've cut your dive ship uh, trip short. Are you a little pissed off? Yeah, pissed off on that, but pissed off that uh, disrupted everybody else's. You know? No, no one minds, honestly. Um, well, I, I can't speak for everyone, but the the vibe on my boat, which was separate, was that just shit happens, and um, it's all good. Yeah, shit happens. That's it. All right. Well, we'll check in in a couple of hours and make some more jokes at your expense. And let's get straight into the second stabbing victim on the same day. His name's Joel. And, uh, but Joel's just one of those guys. He's full of stoke. He's just, he's a mad dude to be around. And I am uh, a little bit cheeky with him here. So bear with Joel. I thoroughly like him. Let's go. I'm joined here by Joel. Joel Jiner. He's now got a vagina on his thigh. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Joel, you were the second person to fall victim to an accidental knife strike. Um, Wayne had a great story about a 21.5 kilo fish wrestling him and smashing the knife into his leg. Um, was your story similar? It was very similar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, describe it for me. Yeah, so I was on the boat, uh, saw tail, at least 700 grams. And uh, looking to burly him up and um, drop my knife straight into my own leg. And um, unlike Wayne's, your one's a little bit less serious, but it's still decent. You've, you, how, how much of the knife you reckon you got into your leg? Uh, like a centimetre, not too much. S sharp knife then? Yes, yeah, very, a Picasso. <laughs> and, um, and how do you feel about life after that? Just definitely feel a little shook, like... Yeah. yeah, like um, I was just was having a good day, having fun, and didn't expect that to happen. But I feel sorry for Wayne mostly because like my trip will go on and his will not. Yeah, I mean that's a good thing you've got uh, a nurse here treating you, and uh, he's doing a great job. Sexy he did nurse. just watch those wandering hands. Yeah, he's a very sexy nurse too, which <laughs> definitely helps. It's nothing like two bearded men treating each other. Yeah, that's it. That's my style. All right, we'll catch up with you after the nurses attended you.
simple, accurate, deadly. Use the code NOOB, N-O-O-B, and save $30 on any spear gun for a limited time only. Go to killshotspearguns.com, check them out for yourself. Handmade in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin. Use the code NOOB, N-O-O-B, or head into the shop and say, Crikey, mate. And apparently Ed will hook you up with a $30 discount on any timber spear gun. Get your hands on one, killshotspearguns.com. So this part of the interview here is again with Wayne Judge. We're up on top of the boat and the RACQ Life Flight has arrived. And big shout out to those guys, the RACQ Life Flight Rescue Team. They do a phenomenal job and they deserve all our support. Um, this is cool. Got the RACQ uh, Rescue fellas here, just about to airlift Wayne off the uh, deck of the boat. And uh, Wayne, how, how are you feeling about that stretcher? Look, uh, just, just another part of the adventure, hell, never done this before, you know. I'm, I'm nervous for you. <laughs> All right, these guys will look after me. What do you reckon, Ass? Does this look like a, a fun adventure? Look, adventure is adventure. You never know whether it's going to be fun, whether it's going to be sad, but at the end of the day, you look upon it and it's, you grow from it, you learn a lot, and you've got a story to tell at the end of it. I think Wayno's definitely going to have a hell of a story. Um, and that's an adventure. He likes writing books too, this will give him something decent to write about. Yeah, he's definitely found himself some um, inspiration and, and uh, <laughs> very much like a, a life event worthy of writing a story about, that's for sure. As, do you think that Wayne should get like a pension and discount for this care flight? <laughs> a pension and discount? <laughs> if he's honest about his age, yes. Can you ask him if there's pensioner rates? <laughs> I'm not going to ask him if there's pensioner. <laughs> <laughs> Are you nervous on his behalf, Mike? Beg your pardon? Are you nervous on his behalf? No, not at all. I'm just wondering how they're going to get him into there. Is he going to crawl in there or are they going to slide him in or push him in? Or I think I'm going to have a harder time. I had a harder time coming up from the bottom stairs up here than I will getting into that helicopter. That's true. That's true. You're embracing your... Um, Vintage, with, with style. <laughs> you know, things get better with age, like red wine, you know. After all the action, uh, getting Wayne Judge back onto the RACQ Life Flight and off to hospital, I did manage to get three full interviews done with uh, Taylor, Tim and the Back to Basics boys. And I also got around to all of the other guys, or nearly all of the other guys on board, and found out about how their trips went. So, Joel, talking about the trip that was, man, what was the moment that just stoked you the most? The moment that leave you just frothing? Oh, it's hard to put it to one moment. Like, I'm peaking today. Um, maybe this morning's session was a great session. I, like, second shot at a fish with my mate. I got to um, stab myself in the leg. So many great times, yeah. Man, you, what, you've been one of the best dudes to hang out with on the trip, I reckon, just because you're so stoked all the time. Um, what was the best fish you shot? I think probably a pretty big, oh, by my standards, trout, like a couple of kilos. Um, but I was also very excited to get my first parrotfish. Awesome, man. Um, was it first time lucky with the parrot? Certainly was not. <laughs> um, lesson, biggest lesson learned on the trip? That's a tough one. I guess probably I've never chucked sand before this trip, so I've always tried to see the fish, shoot the fish, and this trip I've been sitting on the bottom, trying to hide behind things, chucking sand, and not really getting much, getting a couple of things, but just seeing things react to me and come towards me and be curious rather than just always running away. Cool. Not many people get the opportunity to come and do like a four or five day um, liverboard charter. Um, do you recommend it? Yeah, well, I'm obviously like peaking right now. It's been a great day. Um, but yeah, it feels like one of the most epic things I've ever done, really. Yeah, sick, man. Um, so you, you're going to do it again, you reckon? Yeah, I was talking to Jeremy about next year's booking, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. Any advice for um, first-timers that come out here on a, on a trip? 
you're only one second away from ending your trip. Just be careful with your knife and be careful with your spear and try not to forget that stuff because it would suck to be sitting on the boat for four days or I sat on the boat for one day from a silly mistake and it, you know, really feel for our other mate who was airlifted on day one. Man, man, thanks for that. Uh, awesome, done. Um, who was the worst um, deckhand? The worst deckhand. Like, I was pretty high on Jesse from the start. We had we had a strong connection, but, you know, Avi's just cooked those amazing wings, so it's pretty hard to um, nominate a worst deckie in the kitchen with the deckies. They were very good wings, yeah. Maybe your connection with Jesse was just sec- a sexual attraction. Yeah, that's it. I think we've, we've got some DNA, yeah. Um, anyone to thank? Yeah, I think for this trip, I feel like I've gotten a lot better. I'm still not very good, but a lot better in a short time for um, having hanging around a bit with a couple more experienced divers and people who were sort of able to put their own goals aside for a little bit and help me. And um, so, like, Taylor from Adreno, he was great. And also yourself, mate, really appreciate taking the time to put me on a trout even when I can't finish it. And I look forward to seeing that video of you getting it for me. Oh, yeah. Ready for an interview? Yeah, yeah. Not really, but yeah. We'll... We're just doing a couple of quickies. Um, the trip that was um, highlights. Um, what was special to you about this trip? Um, special to me about this trip. What always sticks with me on these trips isn't an individual fish. It's the people you meet and the relationships, the friendships you make from those trips. So for me, it's meeting people that I've always known through an online presence. Meeting them in person, having a beer with them, spearing with them. Um, that's what I'm going to take away from this trip. Special fish though? You did you did shoot a special fish. What was the... Let's go to special fish now. We've talked about people. That's good. Uh, any, <laughs> any fish stand out? <laughs> yeah, I told a lie. All the people are duds. But the fish. Oh, man. The fish. Um, yeah, the fish for me personally on a selfish kind of point of view was the black spot tusk fish this afternoon. Last dive of the trip. I hadn't seen one all trip and um, and this one, big one came in and it was just how it would play out in sort of a fantasy world where it comes in and you line it up, you stone it and the fish rolls over and beautiful 10 kilo black spot tusk fish. That was the fish of the trip for me. These types of multi-day charter, um, are they uh, an awesome thing for all anyone that's interested in spearfishing? What do you think? Yeah, definitely. The quickest way to progress your spearfishing skill set is come on one of these charters because automatically you're diving with divers that might be a bit more experienced than, than you and you take away learnings from those trips that um, you would never have thought of. So looking back, the first couple of spearing trips I went on, they were with blokes like Rob Torelli and these awesome blue water hunters that I took a lot away from them and you know you're all of a sudden at the end of the trip you're diving a lot better than you were at the beginning of the trip definitely for, for all all skill sets you'll um, walk away from these trips a hell of a lot better diver than when you came great advice and the and the rum's pretty good too yeah and the rum the rum's cold and um, the rum's good <laughs> we got interrupted out by through rums but what a great interruption awesome cheers jack um yeah, awesome. And it was awesome to have the Back to Basics guys along for the trip too. So, um, And awesome to dive with you for a, a full day and a bit. So it was bloody awesome. Michael, Michael, the trip that was, lessons learned? Oh, I just um, have fun and relax and enjoy it. On this trip in particular, did you, did you learn any new techniques or information or ways of uh, spearfishing? I had to kill the fish properly before I put it in the boat, not just throw it in. Oh, did you get told off? Yeah, I got told off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one, no, no one loves live fish throwing over the dory. That's for sure. Can you um, teach as those same lessons, please, because he's just throwing in live fish all the time. Is that true that as from back to basics doesn't kill his fish before he throws them in? That's that's true. That's been vouched by at least four people in this circle. <laughs> <laughs> so as and Michael next time are partners, dive partners yeah. you could learn a lot from each other <laughs> um, what was the highlight of the trip for you Michael? Oh, just, just being around a 
different bunch of guys and getting to know different people and their different ways and yeah, just everything about it. Yeah. I'm going to keep going around putting people on the spots, but that's good. Um, who's next? You were uh, Bodie for most of the day today. Yeah, yep, yep. What, what happened? Oh, look, I was uh, just starting. <laughs> hey. No, nah, just effectively, it was just good to see the boys uh, get some time in the water, so I wasn't feeling too crash hot, so I was pretty stoked just to watch them shoot some fish. You got a big G out from Joel before, he was um, stoked. You helped a few guys, um, like put, put a few guys onto their first of particular species and stuff like that. Um, hats off to you for, um, for being, a, for being a, you know, like a giving guy, I guess, because like when you come up on these charters, there's a real temptation to just head off and... And kill stuff. You took one for the team, and you uh, helped these fellas land their things, man. Yeah, oh, like I said, it's just, it's just as good to watch boys, like watch the boys shoot shoot their own first. You know, um, wasn't too long ago that really this was one of my first trips. You know, um, and I had people do the same for me. So yeah, look, it's really it's it's really cool to just see that be able to pay it back. You know, what were some of the firsts you saw thrown over the boat? Oh, we saw some little Spanish mackerel come across um, trout. Tusk fish, um, yeah, it was quite a few actually. So yeah, the, the boys did really well, and it was, it was really cool to see how comfortable they were in, you know, pushing that, even that ten to fifteen, start slowly pushing forward and just feeling really comfortable. So yeah. And um, these these reef trips, you reckon they are pretty good for for um, developing your skills pretty fast? Yeah, it was like, yeah, we we're talking about this today. It's probably you know compared to diving Brisbane or something like that. It's one of the only places that you get you know, multiple times throughout the day to learn or to put into practice different techniques with different species. You know, sometimes you might not see a fish in Brisbane or you might see two species. So being able to, you know, every second dive effectively put something into practice and see if it works or not is, you know, you can jam a lot of, a lot of those lessons into a couple of days diving, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Rumour has it that you, you told someone off for throwing a live fish into the boat. <laughs> yeah, mate, yeah, look, I'm probably one of the, wor one of the worst boaties to have. Uh, I'm pretty straight up, up, straight up and down, so. <laughs> Love it. I reckon that's what everyone needs, especially, like, um, sometimes just a bit of open, honest feedback. And uh, sounds like it was pretty open and honest. Yeah, mate, yeah, you got to be, yeah. <laughs> Love it, love it. Guys, in today's episode, we discussed getting cold. Now, this is not uncommon. Most of us will experience cold if we do spearfishing for long enough. Now, to overcome being cold, you can get your hands on a good set of booties, gloves, and a wetsuit. Super important, and it's always that compromise between durability and comfort. But head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a full range of wetsuits. And uh, the thing I like about shopping online, sometimes you can review, you can read a lot of product reviews and get an idea of exactly what you're buying. Now our show sponsor, spearfishing.com.au, have got a comprehensive list of products with reviews from people just like you and I. So get on there, check out an awesome range of gear, and if you do decide to buy something, pump in the code NoobSpiro at checkout, save $20 on every purchase over 200 at spearfishing.com.au. Thanks for supporting us, guys. This episode of the Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by the world's greatest spearfishing magazine, Spearing Magazine. There are news and reviews for the latest spearfishing equipment and gadgets inside. There's practical how-to and DIY type articles. There's spearing adventures from crazy noobers like you from all over the world. And uh, it's, it's a magazine that you can pick up or you can look at. And if you've got the digital subscription, you can flick through and let it inspire your next spearfishing adventure, even if you're having a dry run. Keep the stoke alive. Check it out at spearingmagazine.com. If you're away from the good old USA, though, check out the international subscription. That's at spearingmagazine.com. The trip that was, boys, um, you two were part of the, the same crew, so introduce yourselves and uh, what motivated you to come on this trip? Um, Chris Fitzgerald, and uh, Jed said that he'd uh, he'd quit if we didn't come on it, so, so I thought I better, yeah. Yes, Jed Claris, I said I'd quit if, if, if I couldn't come, so. 
So you boys work together in Brisbane, but you get out diving all the time. I know you're from Bull Sharks as well, and you're regular listeners to the podcast. Um, it must be overwhelming to meet Shrek in person. Oh my. I'm still coming to terms with it. I just knocked over a beer, actually, when you passed me the mic. <laughs> Do you want an autograph while we're here? <laughs> no, nah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so this trip, boys, um, just describe the, the journey north for you and um, how it all played out day one. Uh, pretty restless night before before the uh, before we left. Um, really quick trip up. Pretty stoked when we got to Gladstone and saw the boat that we we're going to be spending a week on. Um, didn't realise it'd be so big. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it'd be a lot more rocky. Um, turned out pretty well. Yeah, it's really comfy vessel, so uh, really happy with how it all went. Accommodation was awesome. And the meals, the meals have been all right. And uh, the, what about the dories? The dories were great. A little bit wet, just a bit, but they had a pretty efficient bilge pump on them and a couple of buckets. <laughs> yeah. No, it was good. The sparing was uh, great. We shot a few species that we've never been able to nail before, so yeah, it's a win. Species you shot that you were unable to nail before. We'll start with Jed. Um, well, I didn't actually get onto the uh, the big elusive black spot tusk fish that I really wanted, but Strick got a big one on the last day today, which was unreal to see. And just been picking picking the brains of the boys about Spanish and how to get closer to them and stuff, which I've found very interesting and and taken away a lot, which I was pretty stoked about and managed to. Managed to land a big, big trout on the last day um, today, which was unreal. So pretty happy with that. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And I um, had three fish on my list that I wanted to get on the on the trip, and one was a big tusky. So I shot plenty of small ones. Um, the other one was green job fish, which I got. No, I just wanted to get a decent Spanish, which we nailed this morning. So yeah, it was a win. It's awesome. So, so two from three for you. How'd you get your jobby? Um, oh, it sort of was down around about 15, about 15 metres, uh, dove down, I saw a trout behind uh, just a patch of coral, it hit on me, believe it or not, and I uh, couldn't find it, and then I spun around and they were just sitting there looking at me, so I threw a bit of sand up, trying to keep them a bit more interested, and um, yeah, they sort of came back in a bit closer and a nail bun, so yeah I, was, yeah, I was pretty happy with that, it was right at the end of the trip as well, so just this afternoon. Yeah. Um, knowing what you know now, after doing this trip, is there any advice you'd give to people that have never done one before? Look, if you're on the Eastern Voyager, just do it. Yeah, like I, can't, I didn't, I've never been on a charter before, so I didn't really have that many expectations. But I can't fault the crew. Um, yeah, loved it. It's great. I think just if you get given the opportunity or it, or it comes up, if you see it advertised, just jump at the chance because I never thought I'd be someone to end up on a charter for spearing and I absolutely loved it and taken a lot away from it and learned a lot and met a bunch of good blokes and, yeah, had a great time. So. Good line fishing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can you boys just give us a, a, a run-through of what happens on a, on a single day when we're anchored out and we're on a spot? Uh, well, the morning, usually up and pretty early. Oh, I'm usually up kind of five on the dot, that kind of that kind of time. Too keen to get out, so up before sunrise, you know, what are we in now, June? Yeah, so up before sunrise and, and you know, there's already three or four blokes up, so you get up and have, um, have, a, have a good yarn in the morning, suss out what the plan is for the day, and then breakfast is on the table and everyone kind of starts coming out of bed and then... The dories start start getting loaded off off the top, um, and it's you know gone from milling about, still working off brekkie to wetsuits on, and and you're in in your tender in about 15 minutes. It's nuts, a nuts little period, but it's it's pretty cool to see everyone get g'd up, and you you're really excited and and talking to everyone and getting everyone all keen for the day ahead. So yeah, and then so you're out sort of 7 a.m. I guess you're, you're on the water um, you know a bit earlier if, if you can um, and then you've got till about 11 11 30 to get back for for lunch so you you're off and 
you just got to stay inside of the boat, which is on these on these reefs you can get, you know, ages away and and you know search a reef that you really want to check the charts the night before, get a good idea, um, and then you're back and there's lunch kind of on the table and you got an awesome feed to fuel back up, have a few waters or a or a can of coke and then and then you're on. Yeah, you want to go for the arvo sesh? Yeah, okay. So after lunch have a bit of a breather for an hour or so. Everyone just sort of catches up and talks about the morning session. Uh, and then before you know it, the wetsuit's back on. You're back in the dories and you're heading out until, well, I think we got back at five-ish, just after five. Uh, yeah, and then once again, just recapping all the fish you've shot or missed or, yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, the, the boys on, on board get stuck into the filleting. Uh, then once they've done that, you get your, your cryovac machines going, uh, bag everything, uh, stick it in the trays for the guys to go and snap freeze. Um, then we sit around, eat salt vinegar chips, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> there's, a, there's a fair bit of stoke. Like um, like when you go out for a day's spare and you come back, and there might be a couple of randoms at the boat ramp or whatever, but when you come back to the, the Eastern Voyager, there's bloody... 10 other guys waiting to see what fish you unload and there's, you know, there's a lot of stoke being shared and stories are going straight away. Did you guys enjoy that part of it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it just, um, and everyone's just so hyped. Like, the, uh, yeah, the energy uh, getting back on board and when you're leaving is, is much the same. Like, the stoke's still there. And, um, yeah, it doesn't really wear off and I'm sure it'll still be there on the drive home and, and Jed and I are talking about it Monday morning at work. It'll still be there, and yeah, and then we'll probably be back in the water by Wednesday. <laughs> back into our mur murky old Brisbane. Yeah, yeah, we got to get that big uh, strict-sized tusky. If one of you guys gets a big tusky, will the other one be stoked or jealous? Oh no, we definitely be stoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't. Yeah, we do pretty much all our diving together. And, um, yeah, if I shoot something, then, you know, Jed's just as happy for me as uh, if he'd shot it. So, yeah. And there's a species that he's got, uh, you know, bigger, you know, bit bigger for that species. Or um, And there's some species that I've got a bigger fish for, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, absolutely. You're always working as a team, yeah, trying to get those fish. So, yeah. is, the, is the free dive training that you do at Bull Sharks, is it beneficial for something like this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it is. Um, just uh, simple things like just learning how to do a proper breathe up and, and how to relax, you know. I, I didn't know how to, and I probably still don't to a certain extent, but I'm definitely more relaxed now than what I were before we started uh, training at Bull Sharks. And, um, yeah, it's definitely paid off. Yeah, our dives are definitely, yeah, getting deeper, yeah. Yeah, I just think, you know, our, our whole introduction to spearing was pretty just you know learn as you go and bits and pieces and then all of a sudden we started going to bull sharks and you know you'd be doing doing the the training and you know you'd be just day to day kind of thing just just keep keep trucking away and then wayne all of a sudden would say you know tuck your chin in and, and change your finning technique like this a little bit and then you know, the next the next time you're out in the water, you you do those few things, and all of a sudden you you, you know you're down to 20 meters holding bottom. You're going, holy how the hell did I get down here? And it's awesome. You start seeing better fish, and and you know I think it motivates you a lot more when you start getting deeper and and bombing bigger dives and seeing and shooting better fish in the end, which is what what it's all about, I guess. The core message I got out of all that was like the Noob no Spirit podcast has made the biggest difference to you guys' lives, and uh, yeah. I was about to say that, <laughs> but uh, 72 tips on, well, how many was it? 60, 40, 48 tips, 48 tips on how to, uh, actionable <laughs> tips on how to get better at spearfishing. Yeah, that's always, yeah, it's a good listen. No, it's, it's, on, it's on a lot of work. We run it, we run it on, the, on, on the radio and get some pretty interesting looks from the customers, but we sit there and we always take some awesome things away from it and we love it and when we get out and we discuss or what you you know I might have listened to a different one through the week and and I'll say you know something that I took away from it and then Chris will say another thing that he took away from another one and you know between us we we've learned a lot from it and you know in the end we're getting deeper and shooting better fish from it so yeah awesome fellas um it's been great to have have, have you guys out and I've really enjoyed hanging out with you a bit more and 
I'm going to have to do another one, I think. So awesome. Got a big Nate here, a.k.a. the... Uh, oh, no, I won't, me- oh, <laughs> I won't mention it. I better not mention it. I'll get Jed in trouble. Uh, uh, big Nate, um, how, how's your trip been, bro? Oh, it's been very, very good. I had uh, shot my first trout, so that's, that's good. Uh, got a nice... Nice card as well, so happy days. Yeah, man. Um, who put you on your first trout? Did you find it yourself, or how did that work? Uh, I think Chris might have pointed out a trout. Obviously, I didn't probably shoot the first one, but gave me an idea what to look for. So, so one of the other funny rituals that you get into on these sort of uh, charter trips is a, an informal comp amongst the divers on board. And for this trip on aboard the Eastern Voyager, we had five categories. We had the most meritorious, the biggest coral trout, the biggest mangrove jack, the biggest Spanish mackerel, and the biggest black spot tux fish. Let's get into it with Tim Nielsen as he reads out some of the results from the trip about how they, and, and who, who got lucky with which fish. So we're announcing the awards for, there was five prizes on this trip. Um, Tim's going to announce the winners. So can we start with most meritorious? Most meritorious was a black spotted Mo Wong. Uh, <laughs> that was, would be a new Australian record if he had the guts to actually uh, claim it. But I, I think he's quite happy to, uh, for that record to go unclaimed forever. Who's yep. No, that would not be possible. <laughs> that would not be possible. So, Joel, congratulations. Joel. Yep, yep. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. Yeah. The next uh, prize goes to Ryan for a 4.9 kilo coral trout. Big trout. Yep, yeah. top job there. And... Uh, Biggest mangrove jack was uh, Marcel. Good work there, mate. Marcel. Yep, yep, yep. Good work. Yep. And uh, Wayne, who's not with us tonight because he stabbed himself in the leg and had to get <laughs> chop it out of here. And I'm glad he did, otherwise he might have won a few more. <laughs> he had a 21 kilo Spanish mackerel. So good work there, Wayne. And yep, yep. And uh, the last one's a 10.1 kilo black spot tusky. Jack got that. So great work. Yep. Excellent. Yep. So I think that's all. Great work. We've had a fantastic trip. Let's uh, everyone give a bit of applause to Tim, I reckon, for organising this one. Um, so this trip... Tim, tell us a little bit about it and the concept behind it and, and sort of how it's worked. Yeah, so I try to do at least one reef trip a year uh, through Adreno just so that some of our staff can come out and, and fine-tune their skills. And we've got a lot of scuba diving staff that, you know, really want to, you know, learn how to spearfish and, you know, want to want to, want to come to the, the light side. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we had a couple of guys on board that have only ever scuba dived before, and and uh, they've just absolutely loved it. As you've seen, they've they've just thriving on yeah you know, on the whole. They actually get it now. They understand what, what how we feel and how we think, and that it's such a an amazing sport to be able to hold your breath and dive deep and chase fish and and spear something, and then take it home and eat it you know like it's it's amazing like today we've we've eaten mackerel sashimi we've had trout wings we've had crayfish done in garlic butter we've we've eaten all the legs of the crayfish boiled up and coral trout for dinner that's been a pretty good day hasn't it yeah yeah Yeah, fantastic so um, so this is um about six hours steam out of Gladstone. It's an area called the Capricorn Bunker Group. And it's um, around the Heron Island area, if anyone's familiar with that. So it's called, they refer to it as the local the local group. So yeah, it's great country, 
there's lots of islands, lots of protection to anchor behind, and uh, amazing diving. Uh, it's just uh, a, a great fun trip to be on. Uh, we normally do a five day trip to here. If we go on the Coral Sea, it would normally be a 10 day trip because it's 36 hours steam out and 36 hours back, so you really need 10 days to do it. But here is only six or seven hours, so it's very manageable. So we're on the Eastern Voyager? Yeah, Eastern Voyager, uh, a good ship, um, sleeps about 20, we've got 16 on it, so we're not too crowded, and um, yeah, it works well. Dories? Yeah, there's five dories on board, and uh, we don't, we're only using four, we were using four people in four, which is a good team, someone to drive it, and three three divers in the water. Yeah. The crew? The crew? Yeah, crew, good. And how we get supplied and the meals? Yeah, good crew. Um, they sort of understand what we do. They've been doing spearfishing for a long time. And uh, a lot of the charter boats don't do spearfishing because it's a bit more technical for them. And uh, they just stick to line fishermen. But yeah, Eastern Voyage is good. Hot showers. Hot showers. Yeah, hot showers. Good hot air conditioning. Meals. Yeah, cold beer. Yeah. Great <laughs> meals. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty good trip. It's a really good way to relax. So Adrena runs annually? Normally, yeah. Yeah, there was a few years where we didn't do them. We had, uh, yeah, we were probably all just a bit too busy, but we're, we're back. We've got trips booked for, again for next year. So. Uh, what experience level is it suitable for? Trip Look, I think if you come with some friends uh, that have got experience, you don't need any. You can come with basically no experience, as you've seen with Chris, Chris's crew. Uh, a couple of those young guys that done very little spearfishing and um, you know if they got some experienced divers with them they can learn very quickly and they've, they've all got some amazing fish so um, it's probably doing a reef trip is probably six months to a year's worth of normal diving experience crammed into one week so it is it's like a it's like a uh, you know what do you call it it's a you know super session like it's it's yeah, just yeah. all you do is just dive 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 for a week and you're watching what other people are doing and you're learning and it, it really is a way to fast track your experience that's probably how i fast tracked my experience in the early days uh, i did three trips a year for years uh, so every three months i was going out on a trip and you just learned so much so quickly uh, and met so many new people and you know you met a network of blokes that you could go diving with um, all around australia basically Favourite moments for you on this on trip? trip? Yeah. Uh, Favourite moments this trip? Um, I don't know. Um, can't really think. I think for me, like some of my favourite moments are coming back at the end of the day and you're, and you're more up and like when you go spearing for a normal day off Brisbane or whatever, you come back maybe with a full esky and heaps of great stories. No one's there to greet you. And uh, whereas here, it's like three other boats are pulling up and you're all doing the same thing all day and everyone's as fascinated with each other's esky and what we've all done and hearing the stories and that. I love that part of the trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah that really is good. You're, you're waiting to see the next dory come in and them holding up their best fish and everyone's cheering and, yeah, it's, it is quite, a, quite an amazing thing. And, you know, it's different to a competition where you sort of you actually want the other boats to actually all do well as well. Like, it, it's not it's not competitive it's like it's a great thing you know you're you're hoping that everyone gets some really good fish and has you know a great a great time thanks for organizing and uh, i think i'll be back for uh, the next one maybe next year fantastic great having you on board and yeah it'd be great to have you back next year Equalising, breath hold, relaxing, taking on depth. There's a ton of struggles every spear encounters. Every single person that does spearfishing has an obstacle. They have something that they're working on. They're always trying to get better. For me, uh, at the moment, it's marksmanship. It's improving my aim. I don't, I don't like wounding fish. But if you are looking at the freediving side of things, you have either equalising issues, you want to extend your breath hold, you have trouble relaxing, you don't know how to take on depth. These are very common, and Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving has put together a whole bunch of offerings for you. Check it out, newspiro.com forward slash Ted. There's a whole bunch of these 
uh, online courses that can be studied at your own pace from your phone if you like and uh, you can overcome your struggles. Just check it out, newspiro.com forward slash TED. All right, back to basics, boys. And Zach, who's probably one of the quiet guys in the background that doesn't get to mention a lot of the time. Zach, um, you've been on this trip with us. You've, I mean, obviously the boys have carried you a bit. Like you, 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 you struggle to carry your weight. But um, how was the trip for you? Yeah, that's the story of my life, mate. No, it's been a great trip. <laughs> great trip all around. I had a great time. Really good. Mate, you spared some cracker, cracker fish. You're, um, you're pretty decent with the spear. Thanks, mate. Yeah, no, I had a great trip. Um, I was really, really happy with a big tusky I got, and then uh, Jack and his standard style one-upsman took the title. But um, no, I had a great time, mate. Got some good fish. He he got lucky though. Like he was looking in the wrong direction, and the fish came in on his fin tips. There was no epic stalk. It was just it, it was a it was a good fish though. I'll give him that. <laughs> Thanks, mate. That's the nicest thing you've ever said about me, Shrek. What you did, what you failed to mention was I was laying down at 20 meters for two and a half minutes. It's, it's whisper, whispering black spot tuskfish, sweet nothings into the current, and then he eventually turned up, and yeah, I got lucky and shot him in the head. I could have sworn it was 35 meters and in current, and uh, well, by the time we get back to land, it'll be 40 minutes at uh, five minutes, and he would have uh, he was doing a, a backward roll somersault and the worm across the bottom with a 900 mil um, like pelage spear gun with a single 14 mil band. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Rusty, flopper. No, 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 Rusty, Rusty flopper. Rusty flopper. Love it. No real either. Just skull dragged it all the way up from the depths. <laughs> Nah, it was a bloody good trip, boys. Um, you guys have enjoyed, I've really enjoyed having a debrief with you guys at night and a few uh, rumbos or whatever else we partook of. Um, is that s- standard operating procedure for the Back to Basics boys? Well, yeah, I, I actually wasn't expecting you to come into my room uh, unannounced um, and, and come into the bunk with me to whisper a few sweet nothings and have a bit of a recap as I was trying to go to sleep under dimly lit lights. However, uh, I very much, like you said, enjoyed the, the debrief after a day diving with you, Shrek. I swear I heard three knocks on the ceiling and I got in, you had a baby, a bottle of baby oil in your hand I was, and that sweet beard of yours, there was nowhere else I was going. And we aren't meant to smuggle bananas onto the ship either, but you know, there was a hand of them in there as well. Jeepers, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys should run charters I reckon because people would pay for this. Would they? Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we? Late at night? <laughs> I don't know what kind of people, but um, probably my kind of people. Um, highlights of the trip for you, boys, Zach. Mate, I really enjoyed watching you do the dance with that jobby. Um, there's something really satisfying about third-party perspective. Watching one of your mates get down there and line it up and play the game, and yeah, that, I really enjoy watching that. That's a big highlight for me. So. I got a full stalk of you. Actually, remind me to grab it off my GoPro um, on a fish. No, I, I dropped down third person on you and filmed the whole thing, and I've, I've stalked you, uh, well, stalked you, stalking a fish. <laughs> yeah, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Um, Jack? Highlights? Highlights was, as I mentioned briefly before, these trips are never remembered by a specific fish landed, for me anyway. It's remembered by... Exactly right now. Sitting down, talking a bit of shit, having a couple of drinks with some new friends, meeting some people that I knew online through Instagram and whatnot, and then actually getting to meet those people. And um, that's my highlight, you know, meeting meeting those people and, and the whole experience. Most of the time, what happens after the day's diving, you know, when um, when the sun goes down, that's when I sort of enjoy enjoy these trips. I wasn't really asking you about your trip. I just mentioned the highlights in your hair and uh, you got carried away. But nah, thanks, mate. Uh, no worries. We'll just move on to Ayers. Highlights, mate? I'm glad you noticed that because he put a lot of effort into them. Well, someone that he paid did. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, highlights. Uh, look, I do agree on um, Strix, sort of irrelevant to his hair highlights, his tangent, uh, that, um, you know, the sun, the sun rises in the morning when you get up at the crack of dawn and you're keen to jump in the water um, and dive with people that you haven't dived before as well, such as yourself. And, uh, and you know, you create a, like this unspoken non-verbal bond in the water where, uh, you know, you have all these experiences, whether it's with whales, dolphins, turtles, catching fish, big drifts, uh, big rain squalls coming through like it did this afternoon. So you like bond all over these, these experiences as you're underwater hunting. Um, I felt the bonding from the boat. You guys were in there for like two hours, I reckon, before I got in the water. <laughs> yeah, we just wanted to show you, like, you know, where 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 we were going to set the bar. 
<laughs> no, I'm just joking. I didn't like it was all good. Like you, you were only in there for an hour and a half, so. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't keeping track or anything. I wasn't watching the time. Uh, nah. but, uh, yeah, my, my personally highlights uh, was yeah getting a couple of cracking sunsets. When you watch the sunset, like set behind Australia, and you're out on the reef, it's always very special. But probably the what took the cake was last night after we recorded our podcast with you. We stayed up and had a few few settlers, and um, we just weren't quite ready for bed yet. So we thought we'd go have a look on the back deck just to see what was happening behind the floodlights out in the water. And then there was all these big long toms just pumping through the bait. And then we then we saw like what we thought was a squid, but then it just started coming further and further to the surface, and it was the fucking kraken. It was the <laughs> largest big. The, the literal crack and it was just a giant squid it was so big and then Anzac we were like oh quick 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 get find a squid jig find a squid jig find a rod and a reel and we threw the squid jig out the back and it just came as soon as it hit the water it just came up and engulfed it and ran and just ran into the darkness and just zzz, 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 zzz. and he had, was just kept tightening up the drag and this big kraken just took the squid jig and snapped the line snapped the line and then we just stood there perplexed in the storm at the back of the deck drunk and in <laughs> awe of what had happened yeah just all drunk and disorderly on the back deck and then then today we're out like in the afternoon session the blue water and we're chumming up for a mackerel and then we just saw a, <laughs> another a, yeah half-sized kraken but still a kraken nonetheless big squid came up and started hitting the flasher Hitting the flash, hitting the flash, and all of us, oh my god, oh my god. I was thinking, like, because I was sitting in the boat and it was like 20 meters coming up into 14. I was thinking, they, these boys are on us a macro. That's a lot of that's a lot of shouting. And I get over, and here comes a squid over the back of the yeah. boat. And then I understood a little, little bit of the context, so it's all good. Those are the fun moments on the trips, aren't they? Yeah, yeah there was definitely a backstory to it. You've never heard three men squeal as much over a squid in your whole life, but there was a backstory, and I feel like. It was almost revenge for the kraken that got away last night. Like we took out its younger, yeah, we got its, its younger mate. brother. <laughs> Zach, do you ever feel uncomfortable with these guys? Because they they are pretty serious about their their TV, their YouTube channel and stuff. I mean, back to basics. It's really well known. I didn't realise how serious it was until they busted out Foundation uh, first thing this morning. Started smothering it on. How did you get used to that, mate? I'm still not used to it, but um, you know that's more that's more as he's he's all about the good looks, strikes the brains behind the trust. <laughs> no, mate. Yeah, any any, yeah, any, yeah. Well, look, you got to be prepared for anything, and you never know where the day will take you. That's all I'll say. And some people might even call it zinc. <laughs> but but no, nah, def, def, to most nah, people, foundation. Nah, foundation. Yeah, that's foundation. It self promotion. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's been a cracker trip. Um, do you, do you recommend these kind of trips to, to everyone that, that does spearing? I mean, um, are they relevant to everyone? What do you think? Yeah, I think that if you are curious about diving more, in, especially in places that you may not feel uh, that you've, you've explored before, like if you've, got, you've never dived on the Great Barrier Reef or you've never dived a certain section, yeah, the Pacific Islands, uh, wherever it may be, Northern Australia, far north Queensland, Southern Australia, New Zealand, like if, you, if you're really wanting a certain species or or going on an experience or a holiday or a break that is, you're gonna walk away with meeting new mates, um, having an incredible time, uh, you know, possibly getting some fish or having some underwater experiences that you've never had before, coming away with some fresh seafood, um, but also gaining more skills from diving with people that you've, you've never dived before. Yeah, and as we've spoken about before off air quite a lot, spearing is one of the very few sports where you're completely present in that moment. So a lot of the people that take these trips are blokes that work really hard and just need a holiday. And when you're spearing, you're just locked on all day looking at, you know, looking at the bottom, looking for a certain species, looking at bottom structure, and you're just so present in that exact moment in the hunt and landing the fish. And Mate, the last thing on your mind is your house mortgage or the or the divorce you're going through or, or any of those things that everyone's battling through. So um, as far as a holiday, uh, apart from just the spearing and spearing species, it's, it's just the best thing to do. Go and do it for a week and you're so focused and in tune and present with the moment that at the end of it, you just feel like, you feel like the weight's been lifted off your shoulders. Or I do anyway. Would have been good to see a boatload of ladies out here though. There's 16 fellas, what do you reckon? 
No comment. <laughs> no, I've I've got a handful of really close um, chick Spiros who are incredible underwater and would outdive a lot of the um, male Spiros that I know. So. Um, shout out to those those girls. They'll know who they are, and I very much look forward to running a trip with them or being out on the water with them. And yeah, I'm so stoked to see that there's more um, more chicks getting involved into spearing and they're bloody good at it. I was kind of surprised we didn't get a couple out with us. Like, I, I was actually legitimately surprised because it seems like it's taken off with uh, with, girl, with with girls everywhere. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a male-dominated sport, but I think it's great that women are getting into it. Um, it's definitely a place for them. They're incredible to watch underwater, uh, give a lot of us men a run for our money. Um, but yeah, I'd say for these trips, I'd, I'd echo what the boys have said, and I'd say three other things, I guess. I love putting yourself outside your comfort zone and testing yourself, it's important. Uh, two is networking with like-minded people, it's great. I love meeting like-minded people. And, and three, the world we live in in our lives everyone's so busy everyone's got a lot going on um these trips you know it's a reset it's a mental health retreat uh spending time with your mates in nature doing what you love you can't you can't top that that's that's the best love it there's a um there's another book we've been talking books a bit lately but there's another book out that you guys might be interested in checking out i think it's called the 48 hour effect but basically it was written by um i, I don't know if it's someone that's analyzed a lot of the science but they've they are city-based people, and they've they've analysed people and the the effects on people's um, biological makeup when they spend 48 hours in, in nature, and they've like taken someone from the city and then straight out into the bush, like barefoot, no electronics, and and what it does to your physiology over 48 hours. It's called the 48 hour effect. I haven't read it yet, but I, like I'm intrigued by the body of research that's coming out about this. And I like just to echo what you've said, Zach. I reckon. 100% getting away and just like being under the night sky, having a few brews, talking shit. None of us are on our phones, none of that shit. We're not thinking about how much money I've got in the bank and my automatic payments that have failed this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about any of it. That can wait till we reach shore in six hours and then I'll be in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly right. And um, as far as the book goes, I haven't read that book, but I'd really like to. And all the there's a lot of you know scientific studies around it, but as what we all know sitting here is that um, you don't need the scientific studies. If you go out with a couple of mates camping for the night and experience that, it's a it's something that I can't explain to anyone or describe to anyone. It's a feeling that you've got to go out there and feel for yourself and experience it. You just come back with a, a weight lifted off your shoulders, and you almost even when you you don't believe you need that kind of um, almost a therapy you go you go away from one of these trips being like wow i just feel like i'm clear-minded i'm ready to tackle work or whatever i've got going i'm just ready for anything you yeah you reset and recharge so it's, it's a really special trip love it boys um let's close out with one question i guess it's advice for people that are coming out for their first time trip um words of wisdom from uh from experienced campaigners so to speak well, I guess off the top of my head, it would be don't set high expectations, have, have zero expectations of what's going to happen, but go in with just a, a massive handful of optimism and enthusiasm and take every, every day as, as a bonus and a gift and wake up and just be stoked to be there and just get involved. There's been a couple of guys out on this trip that, like, that are fairly new to Spearing. And they've just absolutely frothed. They've been really cool guys to be around, just from the sheer amount of energy, I reckon. And so, and we're, like, I don't really care how, how good you are or how experienced you are. Like, it, as long as you're stoked and you're having fun, everyone wants to be around you. Yeah, I mean, you're a long way from land too. So I reckon buy the best gear you can afford. A poor man pays twice um, and, and go into it with an open mind. Yeah, that's what I'd say. What about, you, what about your fins, mate? <laughs> <laughs> They're due for an upgrade. <laughs> um, so my words of advice would be, um, what would it be? It would be don't put high expectations, similar to what Az said, on a certain fish or a certain species. Don't say, I need a spear or a 10 kilo tusky to be a good spear rope. You know, not everyone can get one. I understand that. What about a 9.8? 10.2 to kilo. If you get one of them, you must be doing bloody well for yourself. <laughs> But yeah, don't put expectation on a fish or a species. Enjoy the journey of um, meeting different people on board 
and everyone on board is going to have a skill set that you don't necessarily have. Um, you know, say in spearfishing, they might be a great blue water hunter that you haven't done much of. So come in with an open mind, learn a little bit from everyone, and you'll leave the trip as a far better Spiro, um, regardless of what individual fish you shot. I had ours up for some feedback. You guys have been diving with me for a day and a half. Uh, oh, actually, I hit you up, Jack. Um, as and, and Zach, any feedback for me to improve? You've been observing me for a a day or so. I mean, I spent a lot of time boating, but I did get in the water once or twice. Mate, I wish I could give you some constructive uh, criticism, but no, you were just a member of the team and it worked really well. Uh, maybe just watch the wandering hand in the boat there. <laughs> that was deliberate. That was deliberate. <laughs> Yeah, I'd further on from Zach's final comment there that it'd be good to maybe throw in even a safety word, perhaps, when the wandering hands get out of control. No, uh, uh, in, the, in the water... What was the safety word? We're going to ground anything. Kraken. No, there's never, <laughs> no, never a safety word. That's the trick. Uh, but, uh, look, we, we only got... Like, you and I only got today in together, but we, we dived shoulder to shoulder for the afternoon. And, no, I, I felt really comfortable with you in the water. I had eyes on you. You had eyes on me. Um, yeah, one you had hands on me a lot. <laughs> we don't need to. I mean, I felt, like we were, up, we were talking about the relaxation stuff. technique with the hand on the neck, mm. but I've never had the hand on the bum. Yeah. Like, but that was quite relaxing. Really and it was it. like a guiding thing as I duck dived as well. Yeah. Like, he felt the tense, he acknowledged it with his hand, and then just pushed and released. Well, you've only got to ask some of the best free divers, such as Adam Stern, you know, that the neck is one part of the relaxation, but you really need to get around to the, uh, the anus and the gooch region <laughs> to uh, really maximise relaxation. But uh, that's for another podcast, I'm sure. I, uh, I was never been so tense before a dive. <laughs> <laughs> just like a rock. Uh, but uh, what, one thing I always observe when, when I am diving with people for the first time, this is something that we learn in, and when we're doing our, our free diving course is that a lot of Spiros will go down looking at the bottom with their head, head stuck out and they'll be looking at what's around them as they're descending. But the most comfortable way to try and get to the bottom or get depth and still have a lot of, a lot of gas in the tank for your dive and be really relaxed is tucking that chin in. And so, yeah, for, for many people, this, the, the, like the common thing I observe is that the, the chin is not tucked in and it's, it's out, which can, you know, you're using up oxygen a lot quicker. But I, uh, yeah, I, th I thought you were, you were killing it, bro, and look forward to diving, you, diving with you more. Cool. I enjoyed it too, fellas. Um, I'm going to move on and do some more interviews, but um, any parting comments? No, we're good. I hope to see you all out here at some stage. Hooroo. Hooroo. Over and out. Bye for now. Hey guys, have you thought about buying a freediving watch? I think lots of us have. Many of the guests on our show swear by them. If you are sort of a little bit confused and overwhelmed by thinking about which freediving watch to buy, I've got some solution for you today. Go to spearfishing.com.au forward slash computers and have a look in there. There's an Adreno how-to video about how to choose a good dive watch. Now, one of the watches that gets mentioned a lot on the show is the Sunto D4. And they've lately come out with the D4F, which is a free diving uh, dedicated watch. It cuts out a lot of the features that we don't need that scuba divers want. Uh, so it doesn't have tables and things like that, which is just a nice streamlined a simple watch to help you monitor your dive times and, sur and more importantly, your surface intervals. So go to spearfishing.com.au forward slash computers and watch their how-to vid on how to choose a good um, free diving watch. If you do decide to buy a watch from spearfishing.com.au, use the code NoobSpiro and save $20 on every purchase over 200 and support the Noob Spiro podcast at the same time. Thanks for listening, guys. So we've got Jeremy and Nate Dog. Hello. Jeremy, introduce yourself. My name's Jeremy. Uh, this is my first liverboard spearfishing trip. Me too. Um, and uh, other people know me as the manager of the Adreno store in Brisbane. The friendly manager. The friendly manager, yes. That's me. <laughs> You've got a great store. I love it. Oh, thank you. I, I love coming into Adreno. Awesome. Well, there's always someone it. I know. Yep. There's always someone friendly and there's heaps of spearing gear. Yeah, there's... A lot, a lot of it. Mm. But you're a muser, you're an interesting character in your own right? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, play a bit of music, 
And Scuba diving background? Yes, yeah, that's been my background since about 2007. Okay, so you're a muso, and, and how long have you been scuba diving slash sparing? Uh, I started scuba diving 2007, started instructing in about 2010. Uh, worked for another dive shop in Brisbane, which was Pro Dive Snorkel Safari. Uh, maintained that job for a fair while until, like a lot of dive shops, shut down. And then um, once I started at Adreno, I tried to find some time in my schedule to start spearing. Yeah, being around a lot of other divers who found that their their main source of inspiration underwater and yeah it, it seemed like a natural progression nice um you're a bit of a natural underwater like obviously the scuba diving's helped but you also seem pretty relaxed and you don't have any qualms about pulling out of a dive if you're not relaxed but then when you've got your flow on you've got no worries laying on the bottom in 15 meters which is um, uncommon for a lot of people that start their spearfishing. Is that mm. a- advantageous, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's. I guess it starts with being comfortable in the water. Like for me, the diving was always an escape and always somewhere I felt like I could enjoy the silence and the space. So um, I probably surprised myself, I think. So I got a lot of good tips from working with Wayne, who's obviously a great freedive instructor so working with him guys like uh, Matt Luthwaite um, Brett Davis and Caleb all guys who, who just love freediving are always happy to, to share lots of information with me and then on this trip as well um, diving with yourself and diving with Taylor has been really insightful mm-hmm. um, frustrations on this trip missing Missing so many shots. Yeah. <laughs> Missing again and again and again and not, not understanding what I was doing wrong. Have you figured it out? Uh, just, uh, I think it was learning the new equipment, learning new guns, learning um, technique for aiming and when to take the shot, uh, understanding species and how they move and what brings them in. So for me, I think just... Uh, just getting my right personal, my body, getting it in the right position and taking the right aim. All right, cool. I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to get Nate to introduce himself. Nate? Hi, I'm Nate. <laughs> cool. Uh, part-time Spiro. Uh, patio builder by trade. So okay. Pretty cruisy job, I guess. And you've spent, um, you know a couple of guys that were coming on this trip. Who, yeah, who are they? Yes, yeah, so I know Chris and Jed and uh, Nick Fry. Yeah. The catch and cook guy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Chris pretty well got me into it. So sick. And um, what do you reckon it's like coming along on this trip after you've been diving around like the bay and some of the the dirtiest spots around Brisbane? Well, it's a big change actually being able to see what's around you <laughs> before you hit the bottom. Yeah. So yeah, no comparison in Brisbane to yeah. the water out here. So it's really nice. Um. Have you encountered a few species up here that you've never encountered down in Brisbane? Yep. Uh, so I shot my first uh, trout, which I haven't ever seen any in Brizzy. So, and uh, pretty decent size uh, peacock cod, I believe. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that was a. It nice was a fish. cracker, actually. That fish I saw it. That that quite remarkable underwater. How did you spot it? And well, I actually dove down and it was just sitting underneath a piece of plate coral and they've got a very similar head to the the trout and i just thought it was a whopping trout so i shot it and when i got up to the surface they're like oh it's a cod i'm like cool yeah stoked they look remarkably similar to a coral trout you're right um so you ticked off the trout you you ticked off an unusual cod has there been any other catches you've been super proud of uh not in the spearing unfortunately Caught a spangle online, but oh yeah, right, eh? Yep, yep. We that, don't want to talk about that. That's pretty tricky to, to to get on the spear. Did you see any? Uh, no, I didn't see any spangles mm. on the bottom. Mm. Cool. Um, first first charter trip for you? Yep, first charter. So for other people coming out for their first charter trip, what advice would you give them? Definitely jump on it. It's a great environment. You got a lot of good guys out. Uh, you can jump aboard one of the other crews as well and just go diving with those guys. Mm-hmm. Get to learn some more techniques from other people that you don't usually dive with, which is good. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Everyone takes it pretty pretty serious, so. Your gear prep seemed pretty good. Like you were pretty, you seemed pretty organized with your rigging, with your gear. Um, how did you plan for this trip? 
literally just spent bunches of money at a Drano to get everything <laughs> I needed. And uh, yeah, just asked a few questions of what I should take and what recommendations there were, and they gave me good advice. So awesome, awesome, love it. Mainly Jeremy with my wetsuit. You did well. <laughs> um, what was your, the the moment where you would say you, you had the highest sort of stoke on this trip? I definitely think shooting my my cod. That was probably the yeah yeah the biggest one, and then also helping Chris land his uh, Spanish today. So that was great. Awesome. Did you second shot? Yeah, I was second shot. Got cool. a clean one just behind his uh, gill plate. So. Yeah, nice, nice. Sometimes it's a good way to land a first species when you put a second shot in someone else's fish and then the next time one comes around, it's less intimidating, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. I think I'll definitely give it a go next time. But... Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, Nate. Uh, we'll carry on with Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, um, what's what's been probably your sort of highest emotional moment of the trip? What have you enjoyed the most? Uh look everything for me was a wonderful learning experience one one point i do want to make about nate's cod was that uh i'd been missing everything with that gun and nate borrowed my gun and nailed the cod <laughs> and that's how i knew there was nothing wrong with my gun it was just my aim so he smashed it. he smashed a few fish with my gun so i was like all right i'll conquer it and today i yeah nailed a few a uh, few trout with that so which was really good mm. um i mean for me just I was pumped just to be here, just getting to the ocean, getting away from technology, getting away from the stresses. Everything else above that was a bonus. And then from there, you know, having one of my good mates, Joel, here, the Wong Slayer. Uh, oh, you guys are good mates away from here as well. Yeah, yeah we've been, I taught him how to scuba dive, actually, him and his, uh, him and his partner. Awesome. So we've been mates for a fair while. So that was, it's always good to go on a trip like this with good mates. Uh, yeah. um, then... I mean, actually just hitting some fish and then hitting a Spanish mackerel this afternoon was, was a massive highlight. Yeah. Um, so questionable on the size, but... Um, but you got there and we all sashimied it up and, and yeah. ate the hell out of it. It was yum. Yeah, it was, it was really thrilling to get that last shot yeah. of the last dive of the day. Plus, yeah. we you know, swam with mantas, heaps of uh, sharks around. To, man, I'm, every, every dive had a special moment. Yeah, awesome. Um, so yeah, I just and the food on the boat, pretty good. Holy shit! Today we've been extra sport. Oh man, it was good eating some coral trout after shooting so many. Yeah, it's nice to just eat it. It was delicious, and then mm. eating the wings, mm. the trout wings. Oof. Yeah, it's got to be one of the best parts, I reckon. Especially yeah. with a, like a with a butter sauce. Oh man, sensational. How, how have you found the 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 Eastern Voyager in general? Uh, I mean, really comfortable in terms of sleeping, great food, etc. I mean, I've done other liverboards, which are probably more scuba focused, where you have heaps of space for um, cleaning your gear at the end of the day. So it's probably one of those things I would, if, if I'm on it again, I would probably bring a, bring a tub and maybe a few other things to clean my stuff along the way. Yeah, or yeah. Keep it more organised. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's a bit of a mishmash of. It is weird, eh? Well, you bring a big dive bag, maybe you bring a roll of guns or something, and then you you, you don't really want to take your whole gear bag out on the boat, on the dory with you. Yeah. Like, you're sharing it with three other guys. Yes. It's a lot of gear to take on board. Yeah. A, tu a tub would be helpful. Yeah. I look, people invest thousands of dollars in their own equipment, so having the right way to stash it and care for it while on the trip so you're not going home with a bill for hundreds and hundreds of dollars of lost equipment. Is probably a, a key thing. Mm. So anyone coming on the trip, I'd say make sure, yeah, good gear bag and maybe a tub to, to keep it all together. Yeah, nice. Um, but yeah, as the crew, uh, it's sensational. Awesome. Well, that's about it, I reckon, Jeremy. Any other comments, parting, parting comments? No? No, just uh, thanks for being a great influence on the boat. Just uh, yeah, never shy to give good information, but not trying to overstep it. So it was a real pleasure to dive with you and Thanks for sharing your uh, your insights on it all. Oh, good, pleasure. man. Have you ever wanted to build your very own DIY wooden spear gun? Fantastic bit of news for you. Episode 123 of the New Australia podcast is with Killshot Spear Guns craftsman Ed Martin. 
And if you listen to that podcast and visit neptonics.com, the spear gun builder section, you will find a recipe to create your fish killing machine. And it'll have your stamp on it. No one else's. So visit neptonics.com, go to the spear gun builder page and listen to episode 123 of the Noob Sparrow podcast with Killshot Spear Guns craftsman Ed Martin. It's a recipe for success. It'll save you some pain on the learning curve and hopefully inspire a magical weapon of death where you can just slay fish galore. <laughs> um, so I've got Marcel, the Mangrove Jack master. All right, all right. <laughs> and, uh, and Rhino, the Coro King. Um, joined by two huge personalities on board the Eastern Voyager. Big names. Uh, big names. Big names in the spearfishing space. Yep. So, like, if there were spearfishing magazines, you guys would be gracing the cover. Every day. Every Him month. with his coronation trout. That was a cracker fish, eh? It was a good fish. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about it. No, 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 no. You right. talk about all his right, fish. All right, all um, right. Yeah, it took, it took a few dives to get it up. He uh, shot it under a, a bit of plate coral and... Uh, it wraps itself around the, the front edge of the coral. Um, yeah. Yeah, a bit of, bit of current running on the back end of it, so... Were you buddied up with Rhino? I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you see the, the hunt take place? I did, yeah, well, yeah. Well, lay it out for me, lay it out for me. Um, it was it was probably more of a, an attempt to maybe even look for craze, I think. Okay. It was just a, a bit of a scope out under a section of plate coral. Saw it there on the first drop, surfaced, breathed up, and then uh, got it on the second drop. Wrapped self round and then uh, took a third drop to, to untangle it. But uh, so you it you plugged it in there. I plugged it in there. Yeah. Yeah. Righto. Okay. What? Well, actually, on a crane hunt, I did see it. I did actually see it from a distance, and it was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll swim over. Didn't know what a coro trout was until I saw Tim shoot one the day before. Yeah. So I was like, this is this is gonna smash Tim. So I got to get it. Um, but as I dropped, it decided to go under the plate. Um, so then I dropped again, hoping it'd come out, and it sort of just sort of got at the entrance of the, the little overhang. Sort of did this long shot um, as it was sort of swimming back in, and then I did a, a third dive to pull it out. So yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, what a way! What did it weigh? I actually don't know. I'm not really a trophy fish like sort of three, person. Like looking at the frame, and I saw only the frame. It looked like three plus kilo. What do you reckon? Yeah, I reckon it was at least three. At least three. Yeah, maybe I four, would say three. three. Yeah. yeah. It's a good yeah. fish. It's pretty decent, yeah. Crack of fish. So, Ryan, a.k.a. the Coro King. We, 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 we're dubbing <laughs> you that. Coro King. How have you found your experience on this? What, what was your spearfishing experience leading into the trip? Um, I'm a bit of a noob spearo, actually. Mainly short diving. Well, I've sort of grown up spearing with Marcel. Um, heaps of short diving, a bit of nearings on the Sunshine Coast. Um, in the nearings or? Oh, inners and outers. Yeah, yeah right, eh? Yeah. So. so you can dive deeper stuff? Yeah, yeah. I've done a, a couple of the Adam Stern deep weeks just to do a bit of line oh, diving. Right, eh? So, yeah. Um, but it's very, very different to, to spearing, I would say. So, yeah. spearing adds a level of complexity and overthinking, which is my speciality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I sort of had a background in a, a fair bit of spearing, I'd say. We do a fair bit almost every weekend. Um, in terms of catching decent-sized fish, I've got zero experience. So yeah, yeah. never caught a Spanish. Biggest coral trout would have been a kilo, I would say, maybe. Yeah. Uh, That's still pretty good. Like, Sunny Coast, like, they are there, but they're deep and they're, they're not prolific. You just get them occasionally, and you have to be a pretty decent spirit to get a Yeah, uh, a yeah, I think a few have got to be in over 20 metres, a random fluke one in about 10 short diving. So, yeah. yeah, so it's good to get a good trout this trip too, or quite a few trout. So, yeah, sort of have your pick here. It's the, the best thing about doing one of these liverboards. Yeah, just the availability of fish, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. Have you, yeah. what's been the highlight for you of the whole trip? Um... Probably just to fish and and learning from everyone else as well. So, my expectations coming into it were just were, were nothing really. I just needed a break from work and it was a bit over the the poor viz the sunny coast has. Um, so I was just keen to get in the water and have a bit of a swim around. So, 
getting a few fish, decent fish was a massive bonus on top of that. Adds a bit of excitement to it, so awesome. which is good. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go back to Marcel, but just a heads up, I'm going to come back to you and ask you probably one of those key learnings that you've had on this trip that's helped you improve. So I'll just give you a little bit of time to think about it. But um, Marcel, for you, um, how's this trip been for you? And uh, Yeah, really good. I was saying earlier today that um, I think on, uh, on a charter or a liverboard, you learn um, probably like, I don't know, at least 15 sessions worth of diving in the space of four or five days, maybe even more, maybe even 20 sessions worth. Um, not only because of the time you spend in the water, but the opportunities that you get. Because you get so many opportunities at so many different species in a short amount of time that you just gain so much knowledge over like a, a four to eight hour period each day. So yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's probably the biggest thing for me. Do you like the structured day that we seem to run out on the boat? Like the the, the 5.30 a.m. wake up, the 6 a.m. breakfast, the 7 a.m. we're in the dory and we're out. And we're back at 12. We have lunch, then we're back out in the afternoon for another afternoon session. Five o'clock, we're in, we have dinner, we fillet fish, we cry back. We're all asleep by, most of us are asleep by nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at the latest. Might have had a few rumbos and a few good yarns, but that's pretty much the day, way one of some of these days work. I've really enjoyed it, but what, what's been your take on it and what, what parts of the day sort of appeal to you the most? Uh, to be honest, I don't really mind. I, I'm just stoked to be out there diving. I think the the least amount of time that I can spend on the big boat, the better. <laughs> the more time underwater, <laughs> yeah, right. the, the better. So, yeah, I, I don't really mind how it runs, but, yeah, I'm stoked either way. Some of the guys have commented, Marcel, that um, you're a really natural freediver and you look great in the water, you look really comfortable. Where does that come from? Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the water. I've been surfing since I was five and I grew up surfing. Um, and doing surf life saving. So like every weekend I was at the beach for, you know, from sunrise to sunset and I'd train three or four times a week before and after school. So spent a lot of time in the water. So I think that water familiarity has been a big part of learning to free dive for me. Um, and whilst I'm not the best diver in the world, I think that I'm, I'm probably one of the most comfortable in the water and just being around big swell and, you know, diving in, in windy and choppy conditions, it's all pretty comfortable for me. So I think that, yeah, it's probably the, the most, uh, the, the thing that's given me the most benefit. Cool. Um, you've shot some special fish on this trip? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I've, uh, I'd only, similar to Ryan, shot a handful of trout off the, the sunny coast before this trip. So I've certainly shot a lot more than a handful now. Um, I shot my first jack actually. Um, nice. Which I'm stoked about, yeah. Um, but aside from that, I got to see a whole bunch of species that um, I probably wouldn't have otherwise seen. I've, I've seen more jobbies, you know, in this past four days than I've ever seen in my whole life before. And have you shot one? I haven't. I haven't even taken a shot at one, actually. Um, but it's, I think, like, the, the most important thing is being able to, like, easily identify them and understand their behaviours in the water. Same with... So when you saw them, where were you? Um, Were you on the I bottom? Think, yeah, on the bottom. I think typically uh, I've been seeing them off sandier patches, like off the backside of reefs where you have maybe a little bit less current. They're kind of just hanging out, feeding on, you know, the runoff off the top of the reef. Um, yeah. And have you tried any techniques? Not particularly. I think, yeah, I think a lot of the time I've just been like, they've, they've either been you know a little bit small and i'm not super fast on shooting heaps of fish um so i think i'm probably less trigger happy than most spiros only try and really target a fish if i think it's a really good fish yeah um so yeah i haven't, I haven't particularly really like properly tried but yeah it's one one thing i reckon with 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 um progression in spearfishing it's like First thing, you've got to get down to a level where you can actually see the fish. Mm. Then you've got to identify it. And then after that, you might see them another half dozen times before you begin to formulate a strategy for hunting them successfully. Mm. And um, jobfish definitely seem like one of those fish, I reckon. It takes a little while to figure it out. And sometimes there's a bit of luck involved too, I think. It's particularly if you don't use burly. So that's awesome, man. Um, I'm going to go back to Rhino and I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to ask you if you've learned anything on this trip. Um, Rhino, um, the Coro King, what have you learned on this trip? What's been a massive takeaway, something you've learned and applied? I would say the biggest things are just the, um, the range of techniques people use to 
to chase certain fish in it or to hunt fish. So my normal technique before this trip would just be hit the bottom as fast as possible, eyes closed, don't look at anything um, until you settled on the bottom and then you start sussing out what's around you. Um, but doing a bit of diving with Tim and Taylor, uh, like they're just masters in the water at hunting fish. So mm. watching Taylor chase some big, uh, some big Spanish was just amazing. So I like, I did try his technique of, of, you know, sort of avoidance of the fish and let it swim back around to you. Um, and I actually had a few shots at Spanish. They, they did exactly what Taylor said they would, exactly what they do for him. I just had a bit of blue water fever and uh, yeah, and yeah. shot it from too far away. Yeah, yeah. So it's understandable when the viz is just so amazing up here. Um, that's sick, yeah, man. that's Yeah, it's definitely a good tech. And to actually see it working, it's like, yeah, this is good. It works. I, like, I'm, I'm bringing this home with me. So, Love it. And then watching Tim in the water, like just years and years of experience, just seeing how he approaches fish differently to what I do. So, you know, he changes his technique quite a lot. Um, like, you know, hunting easy trout, I guess you would call them, ones that are just sitting there. Like, I'll, I'll see him line them up on his descent and then, like, pick them off on, a, of a, like, a, a long shot before he gets too close and before they can spook, so. Cool, cool. And then I guess this afternoon on the last dive, um, he he saw a, uh, a jobby. You know, he started burling up for me. He's like, Ryan, you got to get down there. Like, it's going to come in. You know, as soon as the burly hits the bottom, it's going to come in, you know, me being me a little bit hesitant and sitting there for ages you know watching all these fish come in not realizing quite a few of them were jobbies just because i don't know what they look like from the surface he's like get down there what are you doing so i got down there unfortunately missed it at point blank point blank as it came in uh came right in on the uh, on the burley um, but you know still good good techniques to learn so i know what they look like from the top now and and sometimes, how to bring him in the belly. Sometimes the fish you miss and, and you don't take advantage of, the other ones that keep you so stoked to come back next time. Yeah, definitely. And, and I almost feel like sometimes, yeah, like that's what fuels the fire. Yeah, for sure. And job fish is definitely one of those. Like I saw one on the first day as I was chasing a big chow. Um, just wasn't sure about the legal size and it, it, it was well and truly legal now that I know the size. Um, and yeah, so after this afternoon, missing one right in front of my my, my tip, yeah, next time for sure it'll be on the list. I'm going to come back and ask you one more question in a minute, um, which will be um, advice for anyone coming out on their first charter. Um, but Marcel, key takeaways, learnings from this trip? Well, yeah, I think the, the two key takeaways for me, or the key learning, was probably fish identification and not so much around, like, I know what most fish look like but being able to see them for such extensive time and having so many opportunities to see them you really learn their behaviors in the water and how they react to certain things so i think that's probably like the biggest learning but i think my key takeaway would be um really understanding and i kind of always knew this but never really applied it that fish really do hang on the upcurrent side of a reef and i think that like ron and i've spent you know days like five six hours just scouting reefs with like no fish but I think that most of those times we probably went to the upcurrent side straight away. We'd be able to suss it out whether it had any um, life on it and then move straight on to another spot if it was dead. So I think, and also that, that if, you know, there's there's no fish around and it's not productive, it's probably better to just move on. You're not really going to be able to draw much out of the reef if it's um, a bit quiet. So I think that, like, on this trip, it's been pretty abundantly clear that, you know, if, if that top side of the reef is quiet, that it's usually quiet for the rest of the reef as well. Cool. Um, advice for people on their first time uh, coming out on one of these charters? There's a, fair, there's a fair bit to, like for me I let myself down with regards to putting all my diving gear in one bag and all my rigging gear as well and then trying to take that out on the dory and in hindsight I think just have a bin and probably if you've got a big bin you could share it with one other diver and then if you've got two bins on board those dories that's ideal, like it's, it's a good use of space. But if everyone's got a dive bag and everyone's got two spear guns, it's just, it's, it's not great. Yeah, I 100% agree. That would, that would be my one piece of advice, is cull as much gear. Bring it on the charter, like, you know, have a backup mask and, you know, a backup of the essential items that you couldn't dive without. Um, 
but when you're actually going out on those those day trips in the dory like our, we ran a really slim operation we all just had our essential gear and then one backup gun for everyone in the team so we took five guns on the boat and then we had one tub which had just like mast fins weight belts and that's it um so i think yeah minimize that gear and I think that that really helps when you're getting like in and out of the boat with just being efficient and being able to jump between dive spots and it means that you get more time in the water and more time yeah, under the nice. water. Nice. Awesome, man. Cool. Rhino, for you, um, any advice for, for people yeah, coming Yeah, definitely. Out just course? adding to what Marcel said there on uh, minimising gear, that was a big thing for me. I guess even before this trip, Marcel's always ha- hounded me. You bring in too much gear. We don't need all that. You don't even need to bring a bag. Diving with Tim, Taylor and Marcel, we had one nally bin, all our gear was in it, float lines wrapped around our uh, wrapped around our guns, so everything was just clean, you streamlined. You guys dive with Timbo, do you? Tim Thomas? No, Tim Taylor? No, Tim Nielsen. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the boat was just super clean, nothing in the way, everyone was in the water quick, out of the water quick, just it's a real clean setup. So, um, I guess other advice is getting your, your gear dialed before you go on a trip. So I, I swapped guns a few days in um, and ended up missing quite a few fish, I, I would say, because I was getting used to the new guns. Um, and packing the right redundancies for the trip. So I snapped a pair of blades while I was out here. Um, good thing I brought a spare pair, pair of fins, so I was able to get by. Um, you know, last minute failures on the night before the trip I had to borrow a gun to to be able to survive this trip as well so yeah bringing just, the right gear is a massive I just brought a set of penetrators didn't have to worry about bringing two sets out <laughs> alright <laughs> <laughs> no no I'm just joking like um, you know gear fails eh? that's, yeah, a, that's the reality that's, and like yeah, we definitely. we like doing a trip like this you actually get to put all of it through its paces yeah. and you get to see what works and what yeah. doesn't and and you know what? You like a lot more after a trip like this. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I do kind of wish I had bought two suits just so I could have a spare and alternate while one dries. But I've got the Nebula suit, which is a like, great open cell, three and a half mil. It's just like I can wear it all the time. It's just a legend suit. So, cool. yeah. Awesome, fellas. Um, so you'd come again? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So pretty cheap for the amount of fish you bring back. So... Marcel, will you come back? Yeah, 100%. I think um, the the bunker group's good, but I think that uh, for my next trip anyway, I think I want to push further north and head up into the Swains and... Do a blue water, proper yeah, blue water trip. Maybe shoot some, some bits of fish. More, more, this is a reef trip, really, isn't it? It's a reef hunting special specialist trip. Apart from the mackerel, um, which not all of us saw and not all of us got to hunt, um, yeah, it's not really a blue water trip, is it? It's, a lot of reef bashing but in saying that like amazing reef fish amazing yeah absolutely i think for for anyone that's you know starting out there's a few guys on this trip that had done minimal spear fishing before that you know landed coral trout you know day after day which is like you're laughing you're laughing if you if you're landing coral trout within you know your first 10 dive sessions that's the dream yeah cool oh good fellas well thanks for you uh joining me for a quick chat Four months on, I headed into the Adreno Brisbane store to catch up with Wayne Judge and hear about what had happened to his leg since the trip. Um, If you had 30 seconds to advertise the Adreno uh, bunker trip that we went out of on the Eastern Voyager, how would you describe it to people? It's just a chance for people to get good fish with uh, experienced spearfishers um, under a controlled environment. Beautiful, cool. Um, Six months on... Is it six months since we went? Nah, four, four months on um, from being airlifted off the off the boat. Um, how's your leg? Describe what happened after, because I, I interviewed you on board before you got airlifted off, and then that was pretty much the last we heard of it. So describe what happened from there. Well, you know the the only thing that uh, you know I missed out on was the fact that when I got airlifted up, they gave me the green whistle. Now. I've never had anything like that, and I always was curious, of course. I'm a writer, and I'm curious about what that does, and, and uh, it did absolutely nothing. 
<laughs> so I thought I should have asked for a second one because I'm never going to have another chance, you know, to find out what that stuff does, you know, um, to just don't do that sort of lifestyle. Uh, but, you know, I might have been sitting there going, oh, it's not feeling at all. And they all around the cabin, these the rescue guys, they're probably going, look at him. Oh, look, he's out of his head. Look. <laughs> so you never know. But, uh, you know, six months on or four months on, uh, it was quite an experience, a bit of a, uh, a wake-up call. You know, you can get very relaxed about sharp edges and uh, simple as that. That's what I was. It was a, 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 just a dumb thing that occurred at the moment of uh, high energy. And, uh, and then, uh, look, I'm lucky I got looked after at the Bundaberg Hospital and uh, I um, took my uh, antibiotics. Uh, there was no infection whatsoever. It healed fast. Within um, a couple of weeks, I was up sparing fish in cans with my son, you know, so I had a, 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 had a you know, good recovery, actually. And look, look, you can't even see. It's just a little bit of change of colour in the skin. There's no even scar there. You know, I was, uh, I was expecting a scar, and, and I'm going to think, oh, well, at least this is something I can have a story about. I'm a person about stories. And it's not even a scar. I'm going to have to tattoo a scar on there. I'm trying to hit Tim up, the owner of uh, Adreno, to sponsor me for a, a tattoo of a uh, uh, Adreno FG knife on my leg. But I think he rolls his eyes at me and goes, you're an idiot, you know. <laughs> so um, Neil Patel operated on your leg, and obviously... He mistakenly did the gender reassignment surgery. Yeah, I know, and I thought I was big enough already, but he obviously had different thoughts. <laughs> uh, good stuff, Wayne. So fully healed up, back to normal diving. So that's a good result from um, from what was a pretty scary moment there for a while. Yeah, it kind of was. Um, it, you know, probably the only time I thought that that I, that I was not. I won't say comfort zone, that's not the right word, but where I thought it wasn't under some sort of control um, was when I wasn't sure where my gun was. I knew where the fish was, I knew where the boat was, but I wasn't sure where my gun was. And, you know, that gun is a bit of a treasure to me, you know. So that was the moment I was, the only time that I felt a little bit traumatised, you know. But otherwise, the other thing, because when I got on the boat, I was squeezing it closed and there was virtually no blood coming out of it. I got onto the boat, looking down, I was checking. I didn't want to have, a, you know, the jets of blood coming out, you know. So I was checking to see if, uh, you know, if it was uh, really bad. And now I'd managed to stem the flow but while I was in the water there was a fair bit of blood that had got out and when I got back on the boat and managed to chop my wetsuit off or slip my wetsuit off and uh, find the fact that that was the one day in all all my time that I didn't have speedos on underneath you know and that I had this crowd of people around it was kind of like a bit of a laugh it wasn't traumatic but I just wish the water wasn't so cold that day that's all <laughs> <laughs> um Bloody hell. So you were in the boat with the Back to Basics boys when you did it. Did they look after you? I mean, how did you sort of stem it? Did you just carry on keeping it closed? Yeah, I had my fingers down on it and pulled the sides together, and that was where it was stemmed. So it was kind of like, and I'm, you know, look, if you check the video, I'm pretty calm about it, and I just see it and go, okay, this is what's going to be happening. I'm, I don't add anything to it, you know, and I knew what had to be, had to happen. I had to make sure the blood was completely stemmed. If it hadn't been stemmed, yeah, well, you would have wrapped on tourniquets, you would have had these weight belts off or whatever. And uh, look, the interesting thing about it is that it did bring up immediate thing. Was there a tourniquet on the boat? We still don't know. We get very relaxed because we have these weight belts. But, you know, a tourniquet is a, or an Israeli bandage, they call them as well, is a great thing and it should be on every boat. Awesome, Wayne. Cool. Well, I'm glad you're all good and, um, yeah, we'll chat with you again in the future. Look, I've got a little bit of a story here, if you don't mind, you know. Uh, I was in the shop the other day. So I was in the shop the uh, the other day, and this young guy comes in limping, and he's limping along, and he's you know obviously looking like. But I, and I look, I know this guy, and I've you know sold him a couple of bit of gear and a gun and that. And I go, well, what did you do to your leg? You know, and he looked at me and he says, stabbed myself in the leg. Now the guys at Adreno kind of mention this every now and then much they like to play a bit of fun and introduce me to customers as the dude who got helicoptered out and things like that so they like messing me over a little bit so uh i thought oh no they've set him up you know so i just looked him in the eye and i said excuse the language everybody you're fucking with me aren't you <laughs> and he looked confused and his eyes going what 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 and I'm going oh he's a good actor <laughs> so I went right in his face and said you're fucking with me aren't you you know with a big smile you know and he goes 
What are you talking about? He pulls up his leg in exactly the same spot. He's got the scar that's about 50 uh, millimetres long and really completely different than me. He's got a good scar. i got nothing, you know. And at that point I went, whoa, he has got it. So he did the same thing, but he was on a rock hop and he nicked his female artery. And he was pumping out and he had to wrap his belt around him. The guy is fairly clued up and because he's clued up, he's around today. He it was not a big jet from what he said, but it was jetting out and it's obviously enough to bleed out because that's a huge artery. And uh, he, um, he wrapped his um, uh, leg up in, a, uh, in his weight belt and got into shore and managed to get saved, you know. So here you go. And it all happened in uh, such a quick time. You know. Anyway, uh, look, it took me 25 years of uh, hard spear fishing to get to the point where I plunged a knife into my leg. And the good thing about this is that it gets me in those odds where it's happened a second time is not going to happen. So all you guys, are, are you're, you're more likely than me, so I can relax a little bit, okay? Sure. There you go. Cheers, Chick. Oh, awesome. Shit happens as well. So even to the best of us, so all good. So also on board the, the this charter was uh, Nick Fry, who's got a huge YouTube channel, as well as the Back to Basics boys. Both of those, uh, lots of guys, created videos. So I'll link up their videos in today's show notes at noobspero.com forward slash debrief. And uh, you can get a, have, a, have a look at some of the, the visuals and the fish that were shot and the experiences that were had on board this trip. Uh, so noobspero.com forward slash debrief. Check out the uh, the Nick Fry vid and the Back to Basics vid. But um, just finally, here's a wrap up of the trip with Taylor Slattery and maybe a bit of information if you want to consider coming on a charter trip in the future, uh, perhaps one of these trips. I'm back here with Taylor three three months after our trip or so. And ta you've been up again on the reef. We've since published our live podcast uh, that we recorded on board. It's good to catch up with you again in store. Um, can you describe to people... You know what one of these four or five days trip you know that we did out on the on the voyager just describe it in like a 20 second if you had to describe the trip in 20 seconds to someone in store how would you how would you explain it um yeah <laughs> <laughs> on the spot hard ah uh, yeah good one uh these trips are probably the biggest learning experience i would say um it's not somewhere where you'd want to necessarily learn to spearfish but as far as honing in on the basics it's something that you don't you can't get in a day trip or a weekend trip um you know the 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 amount of times you shoot your gun on these great barrier reef trips is you know significantly more than <laughs> than a local twee river mission you know so um yeah i'd say that's it yeah it's a big learning experience so just on a general like reef charter trip where you're not it's not catered um, specifically for like for newbies um what's the sort of um, fitness level diving level that you would recommend sort of as a minimum for someone and how could they prepare themselves for a trip like this um look i wouldn't say i'm the fittest bloke in australia but uh <laughs> um yeah diving fitness is look i think you want to be comfortable up to 15 meters to yeah. to really make the most of it um fitness wise Everyone, everyone can take it at their own pace. That way, more so, probably, probably much the biggest thing is once you get there is ensuring that you're diving with the right people on that boat. Like if you can only dive 10 meters, you don't want to be diving and with, to, to with someone who can dive 20 meters, you don't want to put yourself in that position of pushing yourself or also not being in the position to pick that person up off the bottom. So um, yeah, fitness wise, I don't think you need to be the fittest bloke in the world, but um, just having a, a, the confidence in your abilities getting in and out of a boat, the basics on, you know, rigging, re-rigging your gun once you've shot a fish. Um, yeah, everything else you can learn out there pretty quickly, um, but with the people around you. So you need a level of an experience to make the most of the trip, but you don't have to be anything hectic and you can enjoy the hell out of it. Cool. Um, upcoming trips for adreno.com.au uh, adreno can be found at adreno.com.au forward slash trip. Um, you know, have you guys got much coming up in the next year or two that you know about? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've had, um, even with the with the pandemic on at the moment, we've had three trips run this year um, so far um, with a possibility of, yeah, we're hoping that the next one will go ahead. We've just um, got a few people who might miss out on the November trip out at the Coral Sea. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, next year we've got two booked to the, so far we've got two booked to the Bunker Group um, out of Gladstone. Uh, I believe we've got one in May um, and then one again in June. And we've got more filling every day. So if you keep an eye on that on that website, um, we try and we try and update it as quick as possible. I know that uh, I'm looking at booking a coral sea trip out of uh, Port Douglas later in the year around that November. So dog tooth, wahoo, mile, and those species. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna with uh, the restrictions to overseas travel, we're really gonna try and focus on our on our doorstep. Um, and really bring awareness to how good the diving is within Australia. I think that's overlooked a fair bit, you know. Um, but yeah, so depending on what you're looking for, you know, if you're looking at um, pelagics, in particular dog tooth, those type of things, those coral sea trips are, are where you want to go. Um, but for a lot of the spearing, you know, chasing reef fish, gaining experience, um, I think that's where the bunker group trips come in perfectly, or even those inshore uh, ribbon reef trips out of uh, Port Douglas cans. All right, cool. So if you want to find out about um, upcoming trips, go to adreno.com.au forward slash trip or trips, trips. Yeah, trips. And, uh, and find out what's coming up. Just register your interest. There's probably going to be an email newsletter or something just letting you know when uh, new trips are scheduled and you'll be able to book in and uh, maybe come out diving with me and Taylor. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, and if, uh, if you guys have any questions, just flick me an email at taylor, taylor at adreno.com.au. O-R, not A-H, mate. <laughs> Old Taylor, forward slash Taylor. <laughs> La. All right, thanks, bro. Thanks for listening today, guys. Uh, just re listening to it brought the stoke back for me. What an absolute uh, phenomenal trip. A really cool bunch of uh, people. I had an absolute ball. Next week or the week after, we're going to head over to New Zealand to chat with Don and his two Spiro kids, Ben and Max. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Listen and subscribe. Catch you later.